Good morning. How are you today? Fine, of course. Fired up and ready to go. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to meet you all here at the second Hanna Holman Initiative Summit. We have an exciting day ahead of us until lunch. So my name is Per Lager. I come from the Swedish Defense University and has been one of the two facilitators for the Hanna Holman Initiative Executive Program. Um, we're going to uh, meet keynote speakers today. We're going to meet a newly appointed minister of civil defense. We're going to hear, uh, take, take, um, take part or participate in listening to short briefs, panels, and also participants from the executive program coming to share their experience, their take home message from the education program. Also, of course, we are, have a distinguished audience here. Make sure to network, to mingle. Because you know, being alone is not being strong. So build your network here at beautiful Hanasari. Uh, with those opening words, I would like us to, to enjoy a short film about Han Holman Initiative. Please, play it. Hanna Holmen initiativ så handlar om att eh, civilsamhälle, näringslivet och myndigheter i Finland och Sverige lär känna varandra, lär sig om varandras system. Det är ett svenskt finns samarbete för att titta på hur vi tillsammans kan förbättra vår motståndskraft. Warmly, warmly, warmly welcome to the second round of the Hanna Holmen initiative here. To the close cooperation between our countries in all matters concerning security is now more important than ever. Ja erityisesti mua kiinnostaa oppia tästä Ruotsin järjestelmästä ja miten se kenties sitten niin kuin resonoi tähän Suomen järjestelmään. Det handlar om att diskutera gemensamma frågor, exempelvis försörjningsberedskap och att ha en beredskap för att klara av hela hotskalan i samhället. Kurset on sisällön osalta varsin vaativa. Kursinnehållet är ju skönt därför att det inte bara är föreläsningar utan det handlar om att vi får en, ett kunskapsundlag som vi kan utgå ifrån. Och sen pratar vi kursdeltagare i, i workshops för att ta fram någonting som gör oss ännu starkare och bättre i framtiden. Så det var en flavor av programmet. Nu är det... It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gunvor Kronman to the stage, the CEO here at uh, Hanna Sari, uh, the Swedish Calder Foundation, and the initiator behind the Hanna Holman Initiative. A warm welcome, Gunvor. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Good morning, hyvää huomenta. Ärade minister, arvoisa valtiosihteeri, esteemed summit participants, kära vänner, hyvät ystävät. Warmly welcome to the second Hanna Holmen Summit. I'm extremely proud uh, to take this stage today. From an idea that was born during uh, the first phase of the pandemic, we have now step by step built a new collaboration platform in civil defense between Finland and Sweden. I would go so far as to describe. This is a maybe textbook example of how to initiate a new form of cooperation over borders. First, one needs to have demand and one needs to identify it. Then the answer to the demand needs to be planned and anchored with a wide variety of actors. When we started this initiative, we made a background study and interviewed a great variety of professionals and leaders in the field. Partners are the most crucial element. And I think that we managed to get on board the Swedish Defense University and the Finnish Security Committee. That was actually the true recipe for getting the initiative going forward in a successful way. Initial funding for the initiative was received from the principal of Hanna Holmen, the Swedish-Finnish Cultural Fund. Without this kind of uh, 
semi-private public fund, uh, I think we would not have been able to kick this off. For two years in a row, we have managed to recruit 20 key experts and leaders in civil defense for the executive program. Cul this has culminated in reflections and observations in the Hannah Humlin uh, summit that we are in here today and also last year. But most importantly, we have actually now 40 key players in civil defense in two countries that know each other thoroughly. They know about each other's systems. They know how decisions are made in the other country. And all this is the enabler for the societal trust and the operational uh, possibility when crisis comes. A few weeks ago, uh, we received the confirmation that the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency, MSB, has decided to s provide uh, some funding for uh, this initiative. And we really want to take this opportunity to say a big thank you uh, to MSB. And in Finland, we are exploring a widening uh, partnership as well, uh, which probably will uh, make some changes in the setup for, for next year. All successful programs need to be evaluated constantly. That's also the case with the Hannah Holman Initiative. From the participants last year, we learned that we need to put much more emphasis on the introduction and presentation of the civil defense systems in the other country. What we also actually learned this, was that uh, this is a field that easily becomes very siloed, which means that you also learn a lot about your own country's civil defense system, participating in a training and a reflection process that includes not only authorities, but business life and civil society. There's one additional thing I want to mention, especially today, and that's the participation of Norway in this year's program as an observer. The presidency of the Nordic Council that actually is uh, gathering in Helsinki these days, as we know, include an aim to make the Hanna Holman Initiative a Nordic-wide activity. We felt that too fast enlargement can be a challenge, and that's why we wanted to start by inviting one more country to attend. We want to work as we have started, test, evaluate, learn, act, which is a good formula for success. Learn and Act reminds me of all the learnings that we have made during this process about organizational cultures, about different terminology, about the power of doing things together, and the importance of looking at the national environment. Last year's Hannah Holman Summit did not focus on NATO. Today, the situation is very different. The mission of Hannah Holmen is to help Sweden and Finland face the great societal challenges and to solve them together. And I certainly feel that we have managed to deliver on this one. We're so delighted today to be joined by the new Swedish Minister for Civil Defense. And we look forward to a close collaboration over the coming years. I also want to express my greatest appreciation to all you participants in the executive program, to the summit speakers, to the members of the steering group of the Hannah Holman Initiative, and everybody else here present today. Societal resilience and civil defense is more important than ever. And I'm convinced that Sweden and Finland can play key roles in this field, also as coming members of NATO, and facing the new security environment in Europe. And the executive program is only one part of this process that we are now uh, embarking on. 
We continue to need to gather regularly, to share experiences, to share learnings, to get to know each other because people change in their positions. Uh, and we need to have this as a constant process where we deepen and uh, also uh, become better at facing the crises of the future. I'm looking forward to hear about the reflections from this year's participants a little bit later in the program. And uh, I hope that we will have interesting and fruitful discussions for the coming hours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gun Gunvor, for the initiative for the energy and pushing this forward. Thank you. So now it's a great honor to introduce uh, Mr. Carlos Garbolin, uh, Minister of uh, Civil Defense. I think it's the first ever, ever uh, minister that had that title since the 40s. Correct. So, uh, timely. Uh, you have been a member of the parliament for, since 2010, if I'm correct, for the Moderaterna or Kokomus in, in, in Sweden. You have a Masters of Law, and the first trip you make abroad as a minister is, of course, to Helsinki in Finland. A warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gunvor, dear distinguished guests. Uh, let me first of all say thank you for inviting me to this initiative summit. What I've seen and learned from the Hannah Holman initiative so far is, is very, very promising. And <clears throat> this is also my first visit abroad as newly appointed minister. And it is, is of course, not a coincidence that it goes to uh, Finland, just as it is not a coincidence that our prime minister and minister of defense earlier paid their first visit to Finland. It is marking uh, and it is an expression of the close uh, bonds that Sweden and Finland have and that we all cherish. We can now see a deteriorated security situation in our neighborhood and in Europe in the light of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Sweden will therefore, and have already, intensified the buildup of Sweden's total defense. The situation also underlines the necessity of a strengthened crisis preparedness. According to that, the government of which I belong, and for the first time has appointed a Minister of Civil Defense, I am determined to continue and speed up the development of civil defense and crisis preparedness in the coming years. The civil defense, as you all know, consists of very many different actors, agencies, companies, organizations, but first and foremost, citizens. Civil defense and military defense need to be viewed as a whole. It needs to be developed in a coordinated fashion, and there should be coherent planning for Swedish total defense. Crisis preparedness and civil defense should therefore be seen as mutually reinforcing. A coordinated, effective direction for the Swedish total defense also facilitates corporations with other states and organizations. And Sweden and Finland have had a close dialogue for many years and on many different levels in the Nordic framework, the Haga Initiative state goals and ambitions for deepening the Swedish Finnish <clears throat> for, de for deepening the Swedish Finnish bilateral cooperation within the civil defense and crisis preparedness. The goal is to strengthen <clears throat> resilience in our countries individually and together. The letter of intent about strengthened cooperation and exchange of information in the field of civil preparedness and rescue services that our country signed last year gave an important signal to actors within our crisis management system uh, that it's time to step up our co common efforts to increase cooperation. I have been informed that on both ministerial and agency level, there is a focus on areas where we have bilat bilateral interests. 
And I'm looking for, very much forward to meeting your Minister of Internal Affairs, Krista Mikkonen, uh, later this day. Many factors that facilita facilitates our daily lives also make us vulnerable. The digital area gives us many opportunities, but also risks. An increased focus on information and cybersecurity is, I would say, of the essence. The close relationships between our, <clears throat> our countries has a very long history and our cooperation within many different areas is unique. I would also like to stress that defense cooperation between Sweden and Finland has been ongoing for, se for several years and now the Hanna Holman initiative is an op opportunity to further strengthen the civilian uh, the civilian side of this, the civilian uh, um, uh, defense and, and, and uh, crisis handling. One of the cooperation areas where we have discussed, <clears throat> that we have discussed, is supply preparedness. Our Sweden, Swedish agency MSB and your National Emergency Supply Agency, NISA, have regularly exchanged when it comes to the security of supply. Uh, I appreciate the steps taken to strengthen this important area, and I will later today, straight off this summit, uh, will go and visit uh, NISA, which I'm looking very much forward to. Sadly, the security situation in our part of the world has uh, deteriorated and severely worsened since February 24th. In this new security environment, <clears throat> we also have a new common initiative uh, <clears throat> where our two countries endeavor together. The NATO application that Sweden and Finland made together will also increase and have already increased our common ability. On the 1st of October, Swedish <clears throat> agencies entered a new structure for civil defense and crisis preparedness. It includes, among many other things, introduction of six geographic uh, state government areas for civil defense and 10 different sectors uh, for important societal functions. Each sector is led by one appointed agency and the aim is to strengthen our resistance to handle peacetime crisis as well as high alert or in worst case, war. And that last thing should always be the dimensioning factor for what we do. Another part of the work is to ensure the most important societal functions is <clears throat> another part of the work to ensure the most important societal function is strengthening information and security and cybersecurity and reducing vulnerabilities. An important component of this is to establish a cybersecurity center and a stronger cooperation in between agencies in Sweden. And I would like to also stress that in crisis as well as war times, citizens' engagement in society and trust in societal functions is crucial. As well as agencies, the state and government have our responsibilities, the individual in every society also have a responsibility uh, to be prepared. We want to increase the resilience and defense will, but we also need to repair, pre, we also need to increase the civil preparedness. For example, how long can your household withstand the situation uh, with a long shortage of electricity? How prepared are you and your family our both society's preparedness for crisis is a good preparation for even worse, worse times. And that is, for example, why the MSB recently sent out a letter to all 16-year-olds in Sweden uh, with information about their role in the total defense in Sweden and that they, from the year that they turned 16, can be claimed to serve. And I think that sends an important message of what this 
um, ultimately is, is all about. And finally, I would just like to say that I'm very much looking forward to following your work and your discussions, and I hope you have a rewarding stay here at Hanna Holman. And I'm looking forward to work closely with all you in the in the future. So, thank you, thank you very much for for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. And uh, going from Sweden to Finland, it's a great pleasure to me to introduce the Secretary of State for the Minister of Interior here in Finland, Axeli Koskila, to the stage. Uh, you have been a State Secretary for a little bit more than one year, but you have a, a long and successful career within different ministries. Uh, the stage is yours. Welcome. Minister Bulin, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to be here today with some opening comments from my part from the Ministry of the Interior uh, in this Hannah Holman Initiative Summit. I have understood from our part participant, participant in the Hannah Holman Initiative that the whole program has been very interesting and rewarding in many ways, and I am sure the other participants can agree on this. Last year and this year, it has, I have heard many good stories of this summit. The recent crisis, first the pandemic, and then the Russian attack in Ukraine, and now the latest development in Europe have affected us all in unpredictable, unpredictable ways. We have indeed to, uh, to adjust to new many things, and at the same time face different shortcomings. Energy crisis and the attacks against critical infrastructure are just a few examples of this. The help needed in Ukraine is immense, and the efforts and work need to continue. Finland's civilian material assistance to Ukraine is coordinated within the European Union's civil protection uh, mechanism through the Ministry of Interior, and we will continue to work as long as needed and possible. Resilience, crisis resilience, or crisis preparedness, which is the term you have been using in this context, has become an important policy area in meeting the challenges of a challenging, changing security environment. The war in Ukraine has shown how important a resilient civil society is, even in a military conflict. In a war, a country still needs energy, digital services, cyber security, the soft infrastructure, so to speak, but also the hard infrastructure, road infrastructure, as well as rescue and police services. In order to have resilient societies, a wide civilian, military, and private sector input and knowledge are needed. But the most important is a good cooperation among these sectors. The Hannah Hallman Initiative is a good example of this cooperation. The participants in the program come from all of these above mentioned sectors. Not only do they learn from the program itself, but most impor importantly, they learn from each other. In a crisis situation, it is essential that you know who to contact, what authorities are in charge of, also in your neighboring country. In Finland, there are important elements when discussing resilience. All hazards approach to preparedness, whole of government approach in terms of organizing responsibilities between the various authorities, and also a whole of society approach which all require various societal actors. The role of individual citizens in building resilience is also important. I have a feeling that all of these elements have been elaborated in the executive program. Dear participants, the war, does, uh, the war should not make us forget other threats. As we know, 
climate change and the loss of biodiversity affect us all aspects of our societies. The Baltic Sea next to us is also in crisis. As a result, uh, climate change may see even more severe extreme weather events, from forest fire to severe flooding, and already now calls for stronger preparedness and strengthened climate resilience. Close cooperation between Finland and Sweden on every level in all matters concerning security is now more important than ever. Steps towards NATO, NATO membership are to be continued together. At the ministerial level, the letter of intent that the minister also mentioned that is to in deepen cooperation in civil preparedness, and it was signed last February, or February uh, 21, between Swedish Minister of Justice and the Finnish Minister of the Interior. The ministers met again this spring here in Helsinki and emphasized the importance of the work and the continuation of it. The NATO resilience discussion is also of particular interest for our ministry. The cooperation between our co countries continue close and at many different levels. The Hannah Hallman initiative is in line with that cooperation. In light uh, of all this, I am sure you feel today in the end of this executive program and this uh, wonderful uh, day uh, that you learned new things and that you got to know new colleagues and counterparts. I hope that you can use the knowledge you have gained in various uh, relevant contexts. All of this is very important when our countries continue the work for even more resilient societies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and now some sound as well. So uh, now uh, we are traveling to the UK or UK is traveling to us. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our keynote, uh, Mr. Ben Caves. Senior Research Lead at uh, the RAND Europe, uh, where you have been for a couple of years now. I have a long and successful background from the Royal Air Force, both uh, domestic and internationally. So, a warm welcome, and you're going to talk about societal resilience lessons for Sweden and Finland. Welcome. Thank you. I think there should be some slides, is that correct? Thank you. Good morning. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present today. Uh, my name is Ben Caves, as I was so uh, nicely introduced. Uh, and I'm a senior research leader at RAND Europe uh, in defence and security um, based in the UK. I'm going to talk very briefly about societal resilience from a UK perspective and what we can learn from other countries, noting that Finland and Sweden uh, have far more experience in societal resilience planning than many other EU and NATO nations, particularly against the backdrop of the current Russia-Ukraine crisis. Uh, I'll talk briefly about some of the research that RAND Europe has undertaken for UK defence, uh, including defining societal resilience, conceptualising what resilience is in terms of a framework, and identifying lessons from other countries in their approaches to societal resilience. Um, I'll also touch upon how societal resilience can be an effective tool for deterrence uh, if signalled properly. Finally, with Sweden and Finland's pending application uh, to join NATO, what lessons and expertise you might be able to provide to NATO and its member spa states to improve both individual and collective uh, resilience? Planning across the, the, the alliance would be really useful in terms of taking this into effect. I think my key message that I want to give to you today is that most of what I'm going to talk about, Finland and Sweden are already doing. Um, and you've been doing it for many years. Um, however, this may give you some reassurance uh, that in terms of another country's perspective, as well as offering opportunities for sharing lessons in light of your pending applications to NATO. So firstly, a quick bit about RAND and who we are. 
Um, for those of you who are not aware, RAND Europe is a not-for-profit research organisation uh, whose mission is to improve policy and decision-making through independent research and analysis. Uh, we're also the smaller European arm of our more famous um, parent organisation, the RAND Corporation, um, and RAND Europe has its main office in Cambridge in the UK and a small satellite office in Brussels. Um, we also have a small footprint in Australia, and RAND research includes supporting a wide range of European governments, and this includes various ministries of defence, NATO and the EU. It's worth noting that RAND has a long history of work related to Finland and Sweden, uh, or the region, going back to the Cold War, and several examples are listed here on the slide, uh, and these include a study for the Finnish uh, on defence cooperation between Finland, U, U, uh, US and other regional actors, um, including NATO. And other pieces of research have included looking at wargaming or strategies relating to the High North region. And Sweden and Finland have also featured prominently in case studies in several uh, papers in terms of examples of good practice on societal resilience planning. And one of these is for the, for the Australian Department of Defence on uh, defence mobilisation. More recently, RAND has also supported cyber training courses at the Hybrid Centre of Excellence uh, in Helsinki. And we've also had several engagements with Sweden and Finland, particularly against the backdrop of joining NATO. So moving on to societal resilience, um, we know that resilience uh, or how well nations are able to rebound from shock of a, of a national disaster or attack has in, in emerged as a key priority of the governments in recent years. Some nations have had a holistic or coherent approach uh, to resilience planning for a long time, such as your countries, but many other nations still have an underdeveloped or disjointed approach um, to it. And this was brought into sharp focus by Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. On paper, many observers uh, in Russia and amongst the West were convinced the war would only last a few days, culminating in the quick capture of Kyiv uh, and uh, Ukrainian capitulation. Such was the imbalance uh, uh, in size and quality of forces. Yet this has been a, a real David and Goliath story, I think you'll appreciate. As we now know, uh, Ukraine has been hugely successful in repelling Russian attack and even taking the attack to the Russians. And many have put this down to the resilience of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces and its people supported by other countries. A strong will to fight, if you like, in the face of an existential threat. Now, last year, RAND Europe carried out a piece of research for the UK Ministry of Defence, looking at how UK defence could enhance its contribution to societal resilience. And this was in response to the UK's recent cross-government integrated security review, which had identified societal resilience as a key area of concern for strategy and policy in the coming years. The study sought to review how concepts of societal resilience vary across different countries and to identify examples of good practice from other nations that may be able to be adapted to the UK context. We looked at a number of case study countries, all of whom have had particular reasons to plan for resilience, whether down to their proximity to threats from neighbours or the prevalence of extreme weather events. Uh, and in doing so, it became obvious that definitions of societal resilience seemed to be inconsistent and varied between different policy and strategy documents. However, they all seemed to include common language that spoke to an ability of a system to continue to function in times of difficulty and, and, and in, indeed uh, bounce back or recover from shocks with minimal disruption to their systems. We developed a simple conceptual model that identified familiar separate phases of resilience, and I know these, you'll all be thinking those don't look like anything new, um, but prepare, respond and recover with various subtasks that could be expected to take place under each phase. And we described this as a kind of ongoing cycle of response to a crisis and envisaged that there could be multiple cycles uh, going on simultaneously in response to uh, several events as they unfolded. Hence the overlap of the phases, as you can see in the, in the diagram. Now, these phases of prepare, respond and recover will be familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of you and, and are regularly feature um, across a lot of the documents, including across Swedish and Finnish models. However, we found this to be a useful way to conceptualise and organise different examples of good practice when looking at other case study countries. 
Three of the case studies we looked at were Australia, Israel, and indeed Sweden. And I won't go into detail about specific lists of good practice from each country. And if you are interested, please feel free to look at our report afterwards. However, there were common measures that featured across many of the countries that we distilled down into our top five overarching recommendations and that we thought were extremely relevant to the UK context and indeed, I would say, to, to, to many countries. Again, what is interesting about these is that Sweden and Finland uh, are already doing a lot of these and have been doing them for many years as part of your total defence and comprehensive security approaches. But in countries like the UK, these seem to be a good idea that the UK government and defence could borrow. So, for example, uh, improving civil military coordination and integration was identified, including having a more clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Uh, this would require use of military liaison officers to embed in civilian organisations and indeed significant investment to build this capacity. Enhancing communications at all levels to strengthen understanding and trust between military, government, civilian agencies and the general public is as much about building trust with citizens as well as controlling the narrative as a crisis unfolds and to inform everyone of their roles and responsibilities when the button gets pushed to engender a whole of society approach, if you like. Now, exercising routinely between all agencies is an obvious one to me, but requires considerable resourcing in peacetime, and so isn't prioritised by a lot of countries. And again, looking to Sweden and Finland, events like Sweden's total defence exercises in 2019 could be a model that other countries could emulate. Visibility of these is also a great way to demonstrate capability without being escalatory, Finally, exploring mechanisms uh, for rapid mass cross-sector mobilisation uh, is an interesting and important one. And there is a need to consider how the UK, for instance, could do this without resorting to conscription or uh, national service, something that Finland and Sweden may well have been, uh, had established for some time, but which may be more difficult and controversial to accept in other countries. However, we, for instance, have... Um, significant reserve forces and other civilian volunteer organisations. So there may be a way to build the mechanisms enabled by capable technology to activate large numbers of trained people quickly in a crisis. Certainly options here to be explored, perhaps in collaboration with yourselves. Now I want to talk very briefly about societal resilience and deterrence. It is arguable that strong societal resilience from the Ukrainian perspective against Russia has had a deterrent effect, not in stopping Russia, uh, but in forcing a change of strategy after the initial attack stalled. We know societal resilience can be used as a form of deterrence, and indeed the US Joint Chiefs uh, of Staff have defined deterrence as the prevention of action uh, by the existence of a credible threat of unacceptable counteraction and or belief that the cost of action outweighs the perceived benefits. However, most importantly, a deterrent must be credibly signalled or visible to the potential aggressor. It could be argued, for instance, that what happened in Ukraine was the result of a failure by Russia and Western nations to appreciate how strong and resilient Ukraine would be to resisting invasion, a failure to properly signal the capability of Ukrainian societal resilience and its military. And this is something for us all to consider, how to signal societal resilience effectively for it to act as a credible deterrent whilst at the same time preventing escalation. Again, something that Finland and Sweden have already been doing very well given your proximity to Russia. And this leads me on to my final slide and Sweden and Finland's pending NATO applications. Both countries are technologically advanced and bring a number of hard capabilities to NATO's golf bag of options as net contributors. However, in terms of societal resilience planning, you also bring considerable expertise from the good practice previously mentioned and the fact Sweden and Finland are doing most of this already, it is evident that we have a lot to, to learn in the alliance and that could be shared across its member states, raising resilience levels both individually and collectively. With over 50 years of experience, it is in, ingrained within your culture, taking a whole of society approach and coordinated holistically through your total defence and comprehensive security models, bringing together cross-government engagement, including defence, civilian agencies, industry, the private sector, uh, through to your general public. 
And these could be adapted for the Alliance and member states with a bit of thought. Examples within these that should be held up include interagency cooperation, legal powers and structures for mobilisation, public engagement and training, and communication with the general public. Agencies such as Finland's um, National Emergency Supply Agency, or NISA, that have already been mentioned, uh, and uh, with responsibility for stockpiling, could provide a template, for instance, for NATO to copy. Whilst Finland's national defence courses could be a quick win to grow networks if shared with other countries or opened up to observers from NATO. With Sweden and Finland's accession to NATO, you may also see closer alignment between NATO and EU initiatives on societal resilience. NATO at its heart has seven baseline requirements for national resilience. However, we also know that the EU has its Resilience for Critical Entities Directive, which is on the agenda for discussion today. Both can be complementary, but also risk pulling EU members of NATO in different directions. Sweden and Finland's accession could help to align these processes, learning from Finland and Sweden in how to bring the general public into the resilience planning process, including through methods for communication, will also be particularly critical for uh, member states. I think leveraging facilities, excellent facilities like the Hybrid Centre of Excellence in Helsinki to develop and shape good practice could be critical with the ability to bring in expertise and providing the vehicle for contributing countries, the EU and NATO, to exercise and scenario plan together. Sweden and Finland may also be able to share ways to maximise use of societal resilience measures implemented as a deterrent through effective signalling and how you have done that successfully in the past. So all in all, uh, there is a lot to be excited about in terms of what both countries can bring to the Alliance to raise the general standards of societal resilience, planning and preparation. Now, I appreciate that was a quick canter through um, work that we have done and ideas of how you can share best practice with NATO and the Alliance. But happy to take any questions or perhaps we can take those uh, a bit later. Thank you so much, Mr. Kate. And um...